Hello Internet, Seth Skorkowski, and today we're going to be taking a look at the scenario The Obsidian Bat, published in 2020 as the sample adventure in the Righteous Blood Ruthless Blades core book, and it's intended to help game masters and players learn the ropes for playing the game, and is therefore written for low-level characters. Coming in at 14 pages, especially these little half-size pages here, uh, the adventure is pretty short. The characters are tasked with transporting a valuable item between cities. We have the potential for several encounters along the way with a variety of NPCs, some of those best solved through combat, while others, combat is probably the last way that they want to solve it, because while the player characters might be first level or second level, several of the encounters are with martial artists that are far above that level. It also gives us the opportunity for the characters to earn some major rewards depending on what they do. However, even being an introductory adventure, there are a few places that game masters should look out for. So, what I'm going to do is offer my tips, my suggestions, and my criticisms as a game master who has successfully run this adventure. And I'm Jack the NPC, fearless wuxia warrior that's too low level for anybody to have really heard of yet. I'm here to give it to you from a player's side of things as I get to face off against the weirdest Batman cosplayer ever. But before we go any further, I must warn you that there will be spoilers. So any players in the audience, please stop here. Send your game masters this way to see about running the adventure for you. But if you keep going and you spoil yourself, It'll bring dishonor to your family. Okay, Game Masters, let's jump in. The adventure begins in the city of Handen, home of the well-reputed Handen Escort Company. Recently, a woman claiming to be the Great Heartless Dagger hired the Escort Company to carry the Obsidian Bat, a prized incense burner, to Immortal Sword Manor, home of the martial artist Sword Goddess. Now, once the Escort Company had agreed to the job and they'd received payment for it, Heartless Dagger then slaughtered most of the Escort Company's men and then cut off the leader, Chief Ban Fei's legs for no discernible reason. Now, puzzlingly, Chief Banfei not only hid this information of the attack from everybody, but has decided to honor the agreement that he had. And the reason being is that he's correctly deduced that his employer and attacker was not Heartless Dagger, but her dearest frenemy, Sword Goddess, hoping to soil Heartless Dagger's reputation. Now, seeking revenge, Chief Banfei has a counterfeit obsidian bat constructed, and this one is a bomb that releases a cloud of poison gas. Now, once the forgery was complete, he sent out a call for any unknown martial artists that are seeking to establish some form of reputation. And that's where we enter the player characters. Hey guys, check this out. It looks like the Hand and Escort Company is looking to hire some unknowns. Now, that means three things. One, it's cheap. Two, it's easy. And three, we are perfectly qualified for it. So let's go earn ourselves some reputation. Arriving at the escort hall, the characters might notice it unusually empty. Keen observers might even notice some signs of the recent attack. You know, uh, blade cuts and furniture, you know, some cracked tables, and a couple of blood stains that they hadn't cleaned up. Chief Banfei meets with them in a rolling chair, his missing legs hidden beneath his robes. He tells the characters that the job is going to take five days to complete, and he offers the player characters five silver tails per person, and that can be negotiated up to five silver tails per day if they do a good job negotiating with them, and they're also going to be accompanied by his sub-chief, Wan Lang. Holy crap! Five tails a day? Oh, you got it, boss. You just consider that bat delivered. One thing, though, is uh, what's going on with your legs there? Now, at any point during the adventure, the player characters might figure out the truth of what's going on here. Uh, one possible hook that they could have once the adventure begins is that they go to the escort company to learn about this rumored attack that they had heard about. Or they might discover the obsidian bat is a fake and a bomb somewhere along the road. They've got five days in order to figure that out. Now, if they go back and they confront Chief Banfei about it, he's going to admit to this ruse, but he'll double what he initially agreed to pay the player characters if they agree to go ahead and deliver this fake bat. Now, one thing that I deeply wish that I had changed is the fake bat is loaded with Meridian Venom, which is a signature poison of the mysterious Black Cloud cult. And one of my player characters, who is notorious for making rabbit trails to chase, latched onto that information, and then he tried his very best to make that the only focus of the adventure was how the Black Cloud cult was involved in all of this, and kind of 
forgetting everything else, like the mission at hand and any other evidence that the player characters, you know, the other player characters brought up, or the players brought up, or the game master brought up, stating that that didn't matter, and that only fueled him even more. So had I paid attention to which poison was in the fake obsidian bat, I simply would have just swapped that out with standard poison, which also seems far more effective anyway, as the meridian venom isn't much of a lethal poison unless you're planning on fighting that person immediately after they've been poisoned. Other poisons I feel would work better as far as what Chief Banfei is desiring to do, but word of warning game masters, you might consider swapping out the poisons depending on your campaign. Next, the module never gives a timeline for how long ago it was that Sword Goddess attacked the escort company. It only states that it was recently, so I suggest that you make that somewhere between you know, 10 days or 2 weeks, You know, maybe saying that the escort company was waiting on the bat to arrive from a further location where it was dropped off there, and that's where they were to pick it up and then carry that on to a mortal sword manor, and that gives enough time for Sword Goddess to first initially get home, as well as for Chief Banfei to have the fake obsidian bat created, because they're going to have to carve that thing out of obsidian. Because again, for my game, my players, once they figured out that they were pawns in some sort of larger conspiracy, uh, and they were used to investigative games that we've been playing for years, instead of going back and confronting Chief Banfei about it, they then spent several days first piecing together exactly what happened, and all the details, and the timeline of events, and you know, finding all the artisans, and interviewing them, and the witnesses, and it just, it just took a while. Hey, that is your fault right there. You have run us through so many mystery adventures over the years that of course we're just going to approach every game like it's a mystery adventure. And as far as your weirdly over-paranoid conspiracy theorist player, you have played with the same dude for 20 years now, so you should just know to expect him to latch on to unexpectable things. Anyway, my point is Game Masters, consider swapping out the poison for something that's more appropriate, and establish a timeline between the attack on the escort company and when the adventure begins, uh, because if your players decide to really investigate that and really start prying into it, you will be very happy that you already have that timeline established, that way you don't have to uh, kind of scramble and improvise it mid-game. The module provides us with a map showing the road between Handen and Immortal Sword Manor. And this is a great map, I love it, looks great, however, because the set encounter locations are clearly marked on it, you can't give this to your players without giving away the secrets of, you know, that there's going to be encounters at these locations. So with a little Photoshop, I made this player map to give my players. So for any game masters wishing to use my modified player map in their game, uh, you can find a link in the video description below where you can download that. The journey should take five days, and there are plenty of inns and brothels along the way that the player characters can stay at. So Game Masters, you know, you're encouraged to use the inns, tea houses, and brothels encounter table from the core book, which led to some really fun encounters for our group when we used that. I also think that the Hand and Escort Company should have worked out some sort of arrangement with all the different inns that are along the highways that are leading from the city. You know, something where people that stay there on behalf of the Escort Company are offered some sort of discount, but then the Escort Company gets some kickbacks on the back end for sending their people there. We also have a rumors table for this adventure for any juicy and potentially helpful gossip that the player characters might learn. Now, one thing that I suggest that you might want to add to this is uh, maybe the player characters might meet a stone merchant or a stone cutter that could say how Chief Banfei recently paid a handsome sum for a very large piece of obsidian or uh, maybe made a special and secret order for something to be carved. And he paid a small fortune for silence on that, so they don't know what it was, but somebody knows that he paid a small fortune for a big hunk of obsidian to get carved. The adventure also provides a special Zheng Hu encounter table featuring several NPCs from the core book. One that I made a special point to use in our game was Gyo the Tiny Mouse, who's investigating sword goddess and her possible relation to this rumored massacre that happened at the escort company. He is a really cool NPC and a really good potential ally, so I recommend that you might want to skew the dice that way they're guaranteed to meet him. Now, one set encounter in the adventure is a local criminal named Iron Tooth Bat King wants the obsidian bat for himself, and Wan Lang, the sub-chief that's escorting the player characters, is secretly loyal to Iron Tooth Bat King. So somewhere along the way, you know, he might try Try to get the player characters drunk or distracted in some way, and then Wan Lang is going to steal the obsidian bat and bring that to his master. 
That ended up being a crazy fight on the first night, because it started off with us kinda sorta picking a fight with a bunch of low-level jerks, and they had some amazing roles, and they kinda kicked their asses a bit. But once that fight was done, we looked around and Wan Lang was gone with the bat. We were like, what the hell is going on around here? So we had to track him down, and that led to an amazing treetop fight with the guy, but we eventually killed him and we got the bat back. However, according to the death and maiming table, we punched his ass down to hell so hard that he bounced back up and was still alive again, though his skin was now blackened and bruised, kind of an ugly purplish color, and he was pissed off at us. So he showed up again a few adventures later after that, way more powerful and looking to settle the score for what we had done. So we got to kick his ass again. Good times. Now, of course, any player characters that are injured along the way might attempt to use the Obsidian Bat to heal themselves, because that's what the Obsidian Bat does, which that's going to be a surefire way of discovering that what they're carrying is really a poison bomb. You know, I am both ashamed and grateful. It didn't even occur to us that we could use the Bat to heal ourselves. Now, one way or the other, the player characters are eventually going to meet Iron Tooth Bat King and his iron-headed badgers as he demands that the player characters surrender the obsidian bat to him because uh, it has a bat motif and him being the self-proclaimed bat king means that therefore it must belong to him because he's the bat king and that thing's got a bat on it. This dude is both annoying and crazy. Like, picture the lamest martial arts cosplaying bat band that you can. I should give you a good idea what I'm talking about here. He is all theatrics. He's even got this leather cape with the scalloped edges that he prances around in before the player characters. So maybe have it when he shows up before them. It's after he throws down some sort of smoke pellet and he appears in a cloud of smoke with his kind of bat cape outstretched or something like that. Or maybe you could have his iron headed bat goons, like they jump out in the street before the player characters, and they do some sort of pose, and then they start singing his theme song, and then he appears at the end of the theme song in a cloud of smoke. Or maybe when he's fighting the player characters, he starts singing some sort of theme song to kind of strike fear in their hearts or something like that. Anyway, by the time we met him in the adventure, we had figured out that the bat that we were given was the fake bat and a bomb, so we had that obsidian bat as well as the real obsidian bat on us. So when this guy shows up and he pops up in the road before us and is all like, surrender and give me the bat, we were like, okay boss, here you go. And we gave him the fake obsidian bat. It was hilarious. But then he goes around and he tells everybody how we cowered before his superior martial arts, and that kind of hurt our reputations a bit, so that sucked, but totally worth it. Anyway, this dude then shows up again a couple adventures later, way more powerful and really pissed off at us for tricking him because that bat had exploded and killed one of his iron-headed badges, and he was looking to settle the score, so we got to kick his ass eventually. Good times. Now one thing with Iron Tooth Bat King is he's described as being a collector of rare artifacts, and his hideout is in a ruined Taoist temple to the west, but the only description of what's in his camp is some makeshift tents and lean-to, so I suggest that if player characters do go out of their way to discover the camp, because it's quite a bit off the highway, uh, they might be able to find some really cool loot here, you know, stuff that he's stolen from different caravans, you know, boats of silk, musical instruments, art pieces, baiju, some equipment, maybe a few coins, but just some sort of reward that they get for finding his hideout. They might even find uh, relics from some caravan that he had knocked off a few days before, and they might be able to get a handy reward if they then just return that to the original owner. Eventually, the player character should make it to Immortal Sword Manor, home of Sword Goddess and her Immortal Sword Disciples, which she has 115 of these disciples. Now, only half of them are going to be at the manor, but that's probably still far more than any of the player characters could take on. The module provides us with a map of the manor itself. Once again, great map, but it clearly shows all the location tags on it. Now, these aren't as spoilery as the tags that were on the Overland map, but I still decided to Photoshop them out and make a player map. So, once again, if you want a copy of my modified map, link in the video description below. Now, how this meeting with Sword Goddess goes can go a lot of different ways, depending on what all's happened and how the player characters handle themselves. She might invite them to stay the night, you know, leave in the morning, giving them a little bit of a chance to, you know, kind of explore 
the place a bit, maybe steal some of her many treasures, or she might offer to take them on and train them as her new disciples. Or if the player characters, if they try to deceive her or they give her the fake bat, either knowingly or unknowingly give it to her, uh, that could incur her wrath. Now, she's not likely to kill the player characters because she is so much more powerful than them, and that way she would lose face if she was to kill such low-level people, but she might decide to maim them and have their bodies dumped out by the row with their feet or their hands cut off. Or if the player characters revealed the truth to her of Chief Bounfei's plan of uh, giving her the fake obsidian bat that had a bomb in it, or if they impress her in some way, she's going to reward them with a grain boat or some other reward of equal value. Whoa, 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 a grain boat? That's like 20,000 coins for one of those. That's a small fortune right there. We agreed to keep Chief Banfei's secret for him for 8,000 coins, and we thought we made off like bandits. Overall, we had a lot of fun with this adventure. It serves as a good introduction to the world of Righteous Blood Ruthless Blades, giving a good assortment of what it is the game has to offer, and it works very well rolling this adventure into the next adventure, Pleasures of the Harbor, where Heartless Dagger offers the player characters a job of her own. I find the whole plot, though, with Sword Goddess disguising herself as Heartless Dagger to hire the transport company and then attacking the transport company as a way of getting Heartless Dagger's attention to be a bit convoluted. I mean, and Wuxia, we often have a lot of convoluted plots, but I'd have appreciated a little bit more explanation here as far as whatever her reasoning was behind doing this, kind of, you know, whatever her logic was, uh, maybe even referencing some sort of similar ruse that Heartless Dagger had once done on her, and that's why she's doing it this way. The biggest difficulty that I faced when running this adventure, and this is one that I brought up uh, when I was reviewing Righteous Blood Ruthless Blade itself, is that there is a huge cast of characters, each of them with their own list of special abilities and special equipment. So before I ran it, I made several cheat sheets for each of the character descriptions of what their equipment and what all their abilities were. And these are just bad cut and paste jobs from the core book PDF, but I found it extremely handy in having everything just right there and not require me to flip pages in game. For example, Iron Tooth Bat King and his minions, uh, he's got the stats on his iron teeth from page 84, his iron tooth style from page 49, his engulfing wings of the night sky counter from page 16, and I did that with all of the characters in the adventure that I foresaw some sort of possible fight with. With Wan Lang, we have his saber, flashing moon saber style, and closing defense all in one place side by side versus being on four pages that are spread out across the core book. Sword Goddess, who has four signature abilities, two counters, and two pieces of special equipment, having all of that on one page can be a lifesaver. And because her twin divinities and immortal sword disciple minions all have the same weapons and abilities, though you know, not as many, but the same ones, having all of that on a single page meant that running this combat, if I had to do that you know, with the, her against the player characters and her minions, that would save me and my players a ton of time and frustration and just let us focus on the adventure itself rather than you know, me wasting a lot of time trying to flip back and forth, trying to determine where all these special abilities and what all this equipment did. So I strongly recommend that game masters prepare something like this before they run this adventure, or in some way that they can easily navigate, not just for this adventure, but with all Righteous Blood Ruthless Blades adventures, because I have found this extremely helpful for our games, and I wouldn't be able to run the game without doing this. Again, you can find the adventure in the Righteous Blood Ruthless Blades core book, available on the Osprey Publishing website or on drive through RPG. So once you have the core book, you already have the adventure. It requires a bit of prep, but we found it a lot of fun and definitely worth the effort. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more about stuff such as game reviews, RPG philosophy, just hit that subscribe button. The next time, heroes, you have a great day. You know, you forgot to mention how at Wang's Roadside Wine Shop, where the food is so filthy that you can get food poisoning if you try to eat it, that we figured out that that food was tainted, and we were like, hell no, we are not eating this crap. But then one of our player characters is a professional chef by occupation, so he went back to that kitchen and pretty much took that place over. And now that is the best restaurant between Handin and Kaifeng, and everybody on that highway eats at Wang's. Good times.